chapter 3. And from James chapter 3, we will build our lesson this afternoon. Shakespeare wrote a comedy that he entitled The Taming of the Shrew. And in that particular comedy, Shakespeare uh, had a particular uh, plot that involved around a very cunning, evil, nagging woman who needed to be brought under control. A shrew, thus the taming of the shrew. Now that can be a difficult task, but this afternoon I want to talk to you about something that can be very difficult for every one of us, and it's called the taming of the tongue. And I want to begin reading in the third chapter of the book of James. My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, and able also to bridle the whole body. Behold, we put bits in the horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. Behold also the ships, which though they be so great and are driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listeth. Even so the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire of hell. For every kind of beasts, and of birds, and of serpents, and of things in the sea is tamed, and hath been tamed of mankind. But the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. Sometimes we enter the doctor's office, and when we have a particular medical situation, and the doctor will perhaps uh, say to us, open your mouth and stick out your tongue. Because of his expertise in his field, sometimes he can begin to make a diagnosis just by examining the tongue. Did you know that a good spiritual diagnosis can be made of you and me simply by examining the tongue? Sometimes uh, when we consider the tongue, perhaps we bring to mind a, a book, a book that represents the heart of man. And the table of contents is the tongue. And the tongue tells what is in the heart, just like the table of contents tells what's in the book. Be on guard, James writes, about the tongue. Now, where we read to... Uh, offend uh, carries the idea of stumbling. It carries the idea of stumbling. And probably more people stumble over this misuse of the tongue than anything else. James says you get that under control and you'll be on your way to getting everything else in your entire makeup under control. But that's not easy because verse 8 says the tongue can no man tame. It, can, it cannot be tamed. Uh, therefore, it's going to have to be bridled. It's going to have to be regulated. But we know this. The tongue is that which can bring to you and me much blessing. But likewise, it can also bring uh, a lot of trials and difficulties and burdens to you and me because of the misuse of it. I have never heard anyone say this. I know full well I have my tongue under control. Never heard anybody say that. I know without a doubt that my tongue will not be misused. I have it tamed completely. I don't even have to think about it. I've never heard anybody say anything like that. And that would be really a lie because the text says the tongue can no man tame. Now you can take a wild animal and you can train that wild animal. Because remember, animals uh, are in subjection to man. Now animals, uh, there are a lot of wild animals out there. And uh, wild animals can uh, at times kill people, destroy property. But man still uh, is able to bring the animal kingdom under his control. Now some people take that a step too far in my opinion. They will try to domesticate 
uh, a tiger or something like that have such a wild beast living in their homes with them? Well, a d domesticated animal. I wouldn't trust that for anything. Mm -mm. At this, just, just one particular moment, something might just offset that particular animal, and you'll see how tame that animal really is. And so while man can bring creation under his control, very difficult to bring the tongue under control. It cannot be domesticated. It cannot be tamed. Now, where is the tongue? Well, we know the tongue is inside the mouth. And James 1.19, uh, it is recorded, uh, Be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. Some have said creation itself, that is the creation of the human body, tells us that we ought to be listening twice as much as talking, right? The uh, ears are on the uh, sides of our head, open all time, but not the tongue. The tongue is located uh, inside the mouth, hidden behind uh, uh, our teeth that can be closed, and uh, held within, uh, on the inside of the mouth, and lips can shut and be sealed is that not God using creation itself to tell us that perhaps we need to be quieter than we oftentimes find ourselves? Another interpretation or translation of James 1, 19, uh, tune in, tone down, and sweeten up, right? Be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. Now, James gives us two illustrations in James chapter 3. Uh, of uh, what it means to keep the tongue under control, just as we put bits in the horse's mouth to keep that uh, mighty animal under control, and just as a rudder controls the ship, so it is true also with the tongue that is brought under control. Didn't say tamed, but brought under control. It is bridled. And so it may be small, but notice verse 5, even so the tongue is a little member, it boasteth great things. How great a matter a little fire kindleth. Now the tongue can be used for much destruction. Uh, we consider what a wildfire can do. And occasionally we'll read about parts of the country where it has been extremely dry and then uh, something happens, usually accidentally, where this uh, dry ground or dry grass or dry brush catches fire and it spreads and homes are even destroyed. And we think about the, the damage. And yet that's not nearly the damage that has been caused, uh, that has been caused by a destructive tongue down through the ages. The tongue, perhaps that which we know can bless so many has oftentimes been used to destroy so many. It can happen at home, can't it? When we don't guard our speech at home, home becomes a miserable place to live. We don't always control our speech when we are with brethren and people unnecessarily become offended Strife builds within because we've not been careful about the proper use of the tongue. Nations go to war because of words that have been expressed between the two nations. And so good character can likewise be destroyed because of the misuse of, of the tongue. All of us have known people with uh, good character, but they also have bad temperament. And what will destroy good character as quickly as anything else is for a man to lose control of his temperament. Publius, the Roman uh, Publius said, I have regretted my speech, but never my silence. That sounds a lot like President Calvin Coolidge. President Coolidge said he never did have to regret what he didn't say. That's right. Silent Cal known for saying very, very little. And when he did say something, it was usually profound. One particular reporter sat next to President Coolidge in the state dining room of the White House, and she said, Mr. President, I bet that during the course of this luncheon, I can get you to say more than two words. President Coolidge said, you lose. And he said, not another word. <laughs> not another word. And probably better off for it. Quite a few presidents and politicians probably regret some of the things they say to reporters, don't they? 
And so the tongue can be very, very destructive, including destroying one's character. Now let's think about the influence of the tongue. Proverbs 18, 21, death and life are in the tongue. Now that being true, let's think about how that the tr tongue can be used in a destructive manner. One thing we know for sure is that bad language God disdains. And yet the world today is filled with filthy talking, isn't it? And so our God disdains bad language. Number one, we do not speak in a way ever that should bring reproach upon the church of our Lord. And we certainly not, should not speak in a way that is irreverent toward our God. When Moses came into the presence of God, he was told to take off his, his shoes for the place that he stood was holy ground. When uh, later on Moses would, would uh, once again be in that mountain and God would give him the Ten Commandments, among those commands given by God, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. And so it is that we are never to speak flippantly about the God of heaven. And neither should we be engaged in vulgarities. It is very true that vul vulgarity or vulgar talk is commonplace in America today. I'll never forget being uh, employed by a particular bank in Huntsville, Alabama, prior to coming to the school of preaching. I overheard a woman who was very, very angry speaking on the phone to someone and using every curse word imaginable. I mean, I don't know who it was on the other end of the line. I'm glad it wasn't me. I know that. What was interesting after that is she overheard a conversation between uh, another employee and me talking about the West Huntsville Church where I attended. She said, oh, you go to West Huntsville Church of Christ? She said, I go to such and such Church of Christ. <laughs> now that hurt me. It bothered me. And I'm sure it would you. But when we consider proper speech, we know that vulgar talk is not condoned by God. Whether it is using His name in vain or whether it is engaging in uh, filthy communication. I'll say this also, the tongue should never be used to sow discord. Proverbs six nineteen. among those things God hates, He hates the uh, sowing of discord by brethren. And so while we're to be a people who are interested in unity, we're talking here of someone who uses the tongue to do what? Sow discord among uh, among brethren. Now, gossip can be a very, very destructive thing. And uh, the Bible sometimes calls that tale bearing. Proverbs 16, 28. Be very careful about that which you spread the, by word of mouth, especially if it has negative connotations. It's often been said that when you consider something that may be labeled gossip, before you say anything, you better be sure that what you're saying is true because if it's not true, you're telling falsehoods, you're telling lies. You also better be uh, sure that when you do say something, you know who it is you're telling it, to whom you're telling it because that's very, very important as well. But whenever you feel compelled to say something about another, make sure that what you're going to say is true and then number two, ask yourself this question, is it necessary that I tell this person? Is this going to benefit the situation if I tell a person? And then when I say it, is it spoken with kindness? Now that can be difficult, right? It's very easy to spread something on somebody else that may or may not be true. Somebody says, well, a little, little bird told me this. Remember, there's some things called cuckoo birds out there too, right? And that, yeah, that gets you in trouble. So be careful about this little bird told you something. So the, the tongue to, it can be very, very destructive. And it can hurt people. And so there's some things we need to remember are none of our business and need to be left alone. Your tongue also could be used in this kind of destructive manner. A critical way. Uh, being hypercritical uh, paints you in a bad light. And being critical of others, you know, that's not a good characteristic. 
Can't you find something good to say about somebody else? Some people cannot. Whatever is spoken about another, it is always negative about that person. There will always be fault finders, I suppose, as long uh, as there are people who make mistakes, uh, there'll be somebody to find fault with what they did, how they did something. Always uh, be those who see what other people should be doing, pointing a finger at somebody else, and being very, very critical toward others. So much to the point that, that uh, friendships are marred and cannot be restored again, just like we were singing uh, a moment ago. Friendships that once were very, very strong, brightest links of life broken because of a single angry word. And then sometimes people speak the meanest things, but they also say this along with it, I don't mean to offend when I say this. You know, if you ever hear somebody say to you, I don't want to offend you, get ready because you're about to be offended. Get ready, you are. I don't mean to offend you, but I want to say this, you know. You're about to be offended. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 4 and remember what the Apostle Paul taught us. He says in verse 31 of Ephesians 4, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. He's really to me describing a volcano of human eruptions right there. He says that all bitterness, that's something deep within, right? Just like a spark down within a, a, a volcano, but this thing's going to erupt over time because he says, let all bitterness, that which is deep within, and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away with you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. So we're careful about the tongue because we do not unnecessarily want to to offend, not in a hurtful or harmful way. And by the way, somebody says, well, I'm just speaking because this is truth. Well, just because something is truth doesn't always mean that needs to be said. Sure, it may be true, but why are you telling it? Is it to build up? Is it to edify? Is it to strengthen? Or is it to hurt? You know, truth can be used sometimes as a weapon. And that's never right. And so we're talking about the tongue and its destructive nature. But let's look at the positive side of this. The tongue can, can be a detriment. It can cause a whole lot of destruction. But it can, also, it can also be helpful. If we want to guard our speech so that the things that come forth from our tongues are that which bless and edify, then uh, how can we do it? I would say that the first thing we need to do if we want to guard our speech is to make sure that we keep a pure heart. Keep a pure heart. Out of the abundance of the heart, what happens? The mouth speaketh. And so it, it, is, it, is, not, it, it is not true when somebody says, well, I don't know where that came from. Oh, I'll tell you where that statement came from. Deep within is where that statement was found. Just been waiting to, to come out. And then think before you speak. Listen to this passage in Proverbs 15, 28. The heart of the righteous studieth to answer, but the mouth of the wicked poureth out evil things. Are there some people who, when they speak, they're not thinking? Sure. They don't care. But the heart of the righteous studies to answer. Here is something that I need to address. Therefore, I'm going to be very, very, very careful how I say it and what I say. Now, you think about that in the home. Is that not important? So no one in your home ever aggravates you, right? No one in your home ever frustrates you. And sometimes in our home, because people in our homes do aggravate us and frustrate us, we're just quick to say something. Probably those we love the most, we say the most hurtful things to them, don't we? But if indeed this is my family and I love them more than anybody else in the world, surely I, I, I'm going to wait just a second before I speak. The heart of the righteous studies to answer. That's true with each other in the church, isn't it? The heart of the righteous studies to answer. So he can say the right thing at the right time in the right tone. 
It matters. And so when we're wanting to guard our speech, make sure your heart's pure. Think before you speak. And I have always believed this to be true, and more so now than ever. When you're in doubt about something and how it's going to sound or how it will appear to other people, when in doubt, don't. When in doubt, don't. I know that's true also uh, in preaching. If there's ever some doubt in my mind about a statement that I'm going to make, if I'm like, I don't know how that will be understood. I'm not sure how that will sound. I'm not sure how that will come across. I don't know that that will be beneficial. Then refrain. Because as soon as I go ahead and say, oh, I wish I hadn't said that. I remember Fred Watson used to say to me whenever I'd get through preaching, he'd come in the sermon and he'd say, and, and he said, and when, when you're in doubt, don't say it. And that was good advice coming from a man who, to my knowledge, never preached. Now, Fred had plenty of advice for us preachers, didn't he? We miss him. But he said, when in doubt, don't say it. If you're not sure where you can find that in the scriptures, don't say it. If you're not true whether it's right or not, don't say anything about it. That's right. And in our relationships with others every day, we need to be careful in that same regard. Think before we speak. And then the third point I'd make is this. Don't, don't, say, don't, don't say or tell everything you know. But it's the truth. But it doesn't mean it has to be said. It could be truth that would be harmful and hurtful. And somebody says, well, what about defending, defending uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ? That's always the right thing to do, isn't it? Although I have to be careful about my attitude in presenting it. I have to be Christ-like in the way I handle that. Even when discussing that which is, which is being promoted by somebody else, it's false. I have to remember I'm a Christian. And say things in the proper way, in a Christ-like, Christ-like manner. But somebody says, well, I just speak my mind. Yes, that's what foolish people do. They speak all their mind. They do. And the writer of Proverbs has something to say about that too, Proverbs 29, 11. The fool, the fool speaks all his mind. He says everything he knows. Wise people hold it in till afterwards, Dick says. Oh, wait a while. Or just what? Let it go. Sometimes that's what we need to do. The sweetest thing of all that you can do, dear friends, is to confess Jesus Christ as the Son of God. And when you confess Jesus Christ as the Son of God and make Him the Lord of your life, what's going to happen? You're going to be much more careful than you've ever been concerning your speech. Jesus, concerning His speech, He never said anything that was inappropriate. He never said anything that was vile or ugly. His words were always beautiful, uplifting, edifying, and most importantly, truth. Neither was there any guile found in His mouth. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. And before Pilate, he made a good confession that indeed he was the Son of God. Did you know also you can make that confession that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and no sweeter words will ever come forth from your tongue? And so if you need to do that this afternoon, why not be willing to do so? A penitent believer will confess Jesus Christ as God's Son and be baptized for the remission of his sins by Christ's authority. Someone here this afternoon who needs the prayers of the church, whatever area that may be in life, and all of us could help each other out by praying for one another, but if there's a special need that you have, let us know. We'll pray for you even this afternoon as together we stand and sing.